Um, so originally I was going to talk about a pretty boring topic, which is just sort of like the basics of free and open source software licensing. But uh, Nina suggested um, that maybe I could cover uh, one of the more controversial uh, legal topics uh, in the community these days, which is um, which is licenses like the Commons Clause and the server side public license that uh, that are efforts by businesses who use open source as sort of a business model to um, to essentially exclude competition, build a moat around their businesses, etc. Um, and that sounded uh, more interesting to me. Um, and so here we are. This is going to be a little bit of an experimental talk because it's not, um, you know, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds of the licenses or the law. Um, instead, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, think about how we should think about these licensing trends that are uh, sort of ascendant in our community right now. Um, one being these sort of business friendly licenses um, that may or may not be open source um, and the other being uh, ethical source licenses um, that have cropped up uh, repeatedly in the last several years. So uh, the title of my talk is stress testing the open source definition. Uh, so we're going to start uh, at a pretty basic level, which is what is an open source license? Uh, there's general agreement that it's any license that complies with the open source definition that's published by the open source initiative. Now, of course, the free software movement uh, has its own version of this, the free software definition, uh, generally considered to be essentially the same in its, uh, in its generalities uh, if it's expressed differently. Um, so a, an open source license is a license that complies with the open source definition. Now, practically, it also helps a lot if the license is certified to comply with the open source definition by the open source initiative, which publishes the open source definition uh, and maintains a license review process for determining and certifying whether a particular, li particular license is compliant with the open source definition. So we can say that in reality, or in all practical reality, open source software therefore means software that's licensed under an open source or an OSI approved license um, beyond just complying with the definition. Now, open source licenses are often referred to as the constitutions of open source projects. Um, but in reality, in my opinion, uh, the open source definition is really a lot more like a constitution in the national legal structure sense than a license is. Um, because it's a general statement of high level principles that the more specific rules found in licenses need to conform to. Um, there can be a pretty wide variety in the specific rules that we have in the licenses, uh, but the open source definition changes very slowly uh, by design. Uh, it doesn't vary much from year to year. In fact, it's only changed once in the last 24 years. Now, if you've never gotten into the weeds of applying the open source definition to uh, open source licenses, then it might be easy to assume that it's obvious uh, how the open source definition applies to a particular license. Uh, but if you have gotten into the weeds, you know that it's not all that easy. Uh, and that's because the open source definition is a statement of general principles. It's meant to state the tenets of open source licensing in a succinct way, but in a way that provides room for useful variation between licenses in the same way that a constitution does with regard to laws. It sets out the basic principles. Um, you can do anything you want to within those principles, uh, but don't step outside of them. So it says things like this. Uh, one of its one of its tenets, the first one, is uh, free redistribution. So an open source license uh, shall not restrict any party from selling or giving away software as a component of an aggregate software distribution containing programs from several different sources. The license shall not require royalty or other flat fee for such sale or other fee for such sale. So that makes sense. To be open source, your software's license has to permit royalty-free redistribution of your software, uh, including in commercial products. Uh, pretty uh, well understood tenet of open source licensing. <clears throat> uh, but you can already see uh, the open source definition sort of beginning to fray around the edges with time. The only software delivery model contemplated by this or any other rule is distribution of software. 
software as a service isn't even a twinkle in the open source definition's eye at the time that it is uh, adopted first in 1997. Then you come to a rule like rule six, which is no discrimination against fields of endeavor. The license may not restrict anyone from making a use of a program in a specific field of endeavor. For example, it may not restrict the program from being used in a business or from being used for genetic research. Wow, what's a field of endeavor? It seems pretty broad. Uh, we know it includes two things, business and genetic research. What else might fit in there? You won't find the answer in the open source definition. Instead, like the US Constitution, the answers can only be found in sort of the interpretive history of the open source definition. And a lot of the raw materials of that history can be found in the archives of the Open Source Initiative's license review mailing list. Uh, this is sort of the case law of open source license review. If the open source definition is the constitution, open source licenses are the law, then this is uh, the interpretation of the constitution to the law by judges. Um, and like cases in our legal system, and I'm gonna apologize, I realize we have a lot of people in Europe and throughout the world, and I'm gonna be referring uh, as, as a metaphor to the United States uh, legal system a lot. I hope that you'll forgive me for that, uh, but it's the one that I happen to know and practice in. Um, but uh, again, if the open source license review list is uh, the case law of our licensing system, um, then like cases in our, in our legal system, uh, it evolves as it gets processed through successive generations of human brains that develop, a, that develop in a changing cultural context and come to sort of a, an evolving understanding of what a license means and what it ought to mean and what the open source definition ought to mean uh, in the particular context that they come up in. And, uh, I think it's worth thinking about how that context has changed uh, in the time since the open source definition was adopted in 1997 and today. <clears throat> uh, but despite the uh, sort of gradual evolution and in interpretation of the open source definition, the open source definition is a fundamentally conservative document. Um, again, that's by design. Like the constitution, it's supposed to be resistant to change as a result of the passions of the age. And as anyone who's been on the open source initiatives license review list for a decade will tell you, passions flare from time to time in our society as they do in any society. Uh, the same ideas keep coming up over and over again as though the community develops amnesia every few years, which makes sense. New people join the community every day and it takes time for them to absorb its history. Now, this talk is about two ideas that have come up before in the uh, open source license uh, licensing consideration community, um, ethical source licenses and licenses uh, in the open source style that uh, attempt to limit commercial competition. Uh, now, as early as 2006, a developer named Tiziano Mengotti the developer of a Nutella client, uh, you may re remember Nutella as a uh, free software uh, sort of Napster type uh, tool. Um, anyway, the, the client was called uh, GPU and this developer added a so-called Asimov license to the project license, seeking to prevent military use by providing that the program and its derivative work uh, will never be modified or executed to harm any human being, nor through inaction permit any human being uh, to be harmed. So this is one of the one of the laws of robotics from from Isaac Asimov's uh, universe, and and it was applied by this developer and has been applied by other developers since to software uh, as as a as a statement to to try and prevent uh, open source software uh, from being used for for evil. Um, now, then, as now, uh, such licenses were deemed incompatible with the open source definitions rule number six, uh, which prohibits discrimination against fields of endeavor. In this case, we're talking about the ancient endeavor of war. Now, unsurprisingly, 
those who have been defending the open source definition for the last two decades uh, dismiss recent efforts as merely history repeating itself. So this is a quote from Bruce Perrins. Bruce Perrins, uh, for those of you who are unaware, is the author of the open source definition. Before that, he was the author of the Debian Free Software Guidelines, which are the guidelines that gave rise to the open source definition and on which the open source definition was very closely based. So Bruce was the uh, Debian project leader back in the mid 90s, um, at least, and uh, came up with the Debian Free Software Guides as a sort of statement of principles to say what what was uh, appropriate for inclusion in uh, Debian, uh, the Debian distribution and, and what was inappropriate. Um, and so then he went off and formed the open source initiative uh, as a way of sort of evangelizing the concept of open source in a more business friendly context uh, and adapted the Debian free software guidelines to be the open source definition um, <clears throat> that was the basis for uh, the open source initiatives, determinations of which licenses were open source or not. So uh, what he said about the recent movement toward more ethical licenses is this. Uh, more recently, there's been a spate of ethical licenses which require specific conduct of the software user. Although there, although there has been a regular stream of such things suggested to the open source initiative over the past 20 years, the most recent crop includes the anti-996 license, which requires that the licensee not commit labor abuses, which are said to be rampant in China, the vaccine license, which requires users to get their shots, and the Hippocratic license, which prohibits use abuses against uh, underprivileged minorities. Uh, and so he made these comments in a, in a blog post and goes on to say, essentially, we've seen all of this before. We've had developers try to put ethical use clauses into open source licenses before. And we've known for a long time that these clauses violate the open source definition and shouldn't be included in open source licenses because, uh, well, that's what we decided and it's bad for open source and uh, it, it makes it more difficult to sort of establish the commons of software for common use that we were trying to when we set up the concept of, of open source in the first place. So no surprise that those who have been around since the early days of open source and helped shape what the open source definition is uh, are resistant to recent efforts to, uh, to sort of push on the definition of open source, whether it's from the ethical source uh, side or from the sort of business friendly license side. <clears throat> uh, now, likewise, um, just with uh, just as with ethical source licenses, uh, licenses that uh, limit competition in one way or another have also been around as long as open source has been around. Um, so, to give a couple of examples, um, the Sun Community Source License. Uh, which was previously applied to Java back before it was made open source in certain respects under the GPLv2, um, with the class path exception. Um, the Sun Community Source License gave open source-like permissions, but required modified versions, for example, of Java, to remain compatible with Sun specifications. So they were preventing, essentially, a competing or fractured Java ecosystem with that license. Uh, again, not considered open source at the time, though shared a lot in common with open source and borrowed a lot from, from open source licenses. Uh, and then there was Microsoft's shared source initiative, which received a whole lot of negative attention from the open source community back uh, in the day. And so this was around 2001 when it was introduced. Um, and that initiative permitted a range of activities uh, depending on the nature of the licensee's use. Um, so if depending on whether it was academic or nonprofit, et cetera, um, and how likely that use was to compete with Microsoft's business. So the concept of uh, you know, using an open source-like license to restrict uh, competition um, or sort of other businesses from getting too close to the core business of the licensor uh, is, is something that's been around since open source has been around. Um, and uh, so th these licenses are um, 
considered like ethical source licenses to violate open source rule number six um, because they discriminate against certain commercial uses of the software, which are fields of endeavor like business or like war or like genetic research. Um, so uh, this includes recent efforts um, such as the Commons Clause, uh, which plainly prohibits selling the licensed software, um, and the Elastic License, which is which is excerpted here, which prohibits uh, providing managed services around software. So the the Elastic License specifically says you may not provide the software to third parties as a hosted or managed service where the service provides users with access to any substantial set of the features or functionality of the software. And so in, in theory, the idea behind this particular license is to address you know, what's commonly reported as a problem among uh, software vendors that uh, produce software for sort of cloud services um, that you know, large uh, cloud platform providers like Amazon can come along you know, use their immense resources to offer their uh, to offer these open source services. In this case, for example, Elasticsearch or Kibana uh, as a service, um, and and effectively undercut um, one of the potential business models for a company that wants to make its software open source, but also develop a business model around the software. So, in this case, um, you know, the licensor wanted to offer managed services itself, but feels that it's diff too difficult to compete with someone like Amazon who offers managed services at such a, an immense scale that, that a startup uh, has a difficult time competing with them. Um, now, the licenses like this are uh, quite clearly uh, in violation of the open source definition, at least as it's been sort of classically interpreted, that if you're if you were excluding a particular type of use of the software uh, in a relatively clear way, then you are discriminating against a field of endeavor. Um, so there's really no, there's there's never been any argument, including from the people who develop these licenses, that the Commons Clause or the Elastic License are open source licenses. They are meant to be open source like licenses that give you a lot of the same flexibility to sort of adopt ad, adopt the software. Uh, for your own business needs, so long as you're not competing, um, but uh, but not to give you um, all of the freedoms that an open source software license uh, that would give you. Um, now, they succeed or fail, you know, sort of to questionable and in varying degrees uh, along, you know, along um, their stated purpose, which is to permit everything except for competing with uh, with the original licensor. Um, some of some of these licenses I, I've found difficult to uh, to interpret on behalf of my clients who really aren't anywhere like an Amazon, but the terms of the license are often quite quite vague, uh, you know, intentionally. And so it's you know there's there's a broader set of things where you where you need to go back to the original license or to ask about if you if you are serious about using their software in a more sort of open source way. Um, but Whereas uh, whereas licenses like the Commons Clause or the Elastic License are um, sort of obviously and, and intentionally not conformant to the open source definition, others have been a closer call. So MongoDB developed its server side public license um, with the help of an experienced open source attorney and with the goal of it being an open source an open source definition compliant open source license. Um, so they based the license on uh, the Affero GPL version three, um, and and you know very intentionally I think only changed a single uh, a single section of that license, which is the section on you know interaction with other network services, uh, section thirteen, um, and uh, rather than competing, sorry, rather than prohibiting competing or commercial uses in the same way that the Commons Clause or the Elastic License do, uh, it took the same basic approach as strong copyleft licenses like the AGPL on which it was based. So to require the licensees of the software to make enough of their own software open source that they can't lock down competitive modifications and therefore you know, it basically makes it a lot harder for someone else to compete with you, but it does it by saying, 
you know, by, by essentially having a reciprocity or share alike or copyleft requirement. Now, uh, that copyleft requirement goes much further than uh, the GPL's copyleft requirement. And that's really been the source of the controversy for the server-side public license. Uh, in addition to sort of uh, para-OSD concerns, the server-side public license really didn't fare well in the open source initiatives license review process. Um, but many of the criticisms were rooted sort of only loosely in the open source definition. Many commentators were clearly suspicious of MongoDB's motives and accused them of, of using the open source initiative to rubber stamp a sort of bait and switch licensing strategy rather than sort of in good faith putting forward an open source license for others to use. Um, so I think the most cogent um, open source definition based argument uh, related to the um, uh, related to the server side public license um, was that it it violated uh, rule number nine of the open source definition, which is that the license must not restrict other software. Um, and I apologize, I think I got a little lazy with my slides here, and so I don't have rule number nine up. But uh, <laughs> rule number nine of the open source definition provides that a license may not restrict other software um, with which it's distributed. Uh, we looked at it a little earlier. Um, and that's because the server-side public license requires licensees to open source software that wasn't based on the license software itself. So that would include uh, management software, uh, user interfaces, application program interfaces, automation software, monitoring software, backup software, storage software, and hosting software. Uh, the idea being basically, if you're Amazon and you want to offer uh, MongoDB as a service, then you have to open source everything that makes it possible for you to deliver that service to your customers at scale, and therefore to eliminate whatever competitive advantage that you have, at least based on sort of, you know, what you've built in that superstructure around the software um, uh, over, over the developers of MongoDB, which is to say MongoDB. Um, now, this argument itself, um, that, that this provision of the server-side public license violated um, the open source definition, has its own problems. It's not as clear cut as the argument against ethical uh, ethical source licenses. Um, you know, and the first reason for this is that, as Bruce Perrins himself recognized on the Open Source Initiative License Review list, uh, the uh, the argument doesn't really line up all that well with Rule Number Nine of the Open Source Definition. Um, so that definition uh, says that the license may not place restrictions on other software that is distributed along with the licensed software. Um, if, for example, the license must not insist that all other programs distributed on the same medium must be open source. But as he goes on to say, since software as a service is not distributed, open source definition number rule number nine doesn't apply um, by its literal terms to a use like uh, MongoDBs in the server-side public license. Sorry, he says, the document was written for another time and I couldn't predict today's conditions. He goes on in a later message to say that he didn't even have a lawyer to help him. Um, and, so, uh, and so here again, we see that, you know, there is this sort of common community understanding that, that uh, came out on the o OSI mailing list about this license that, it, that was in violation of, of rule nine or that at least it in some way violated the open source definition, um, but uh, but it's actually a little bit of a poor fit in part because the open source definitions uh, language has you know is is so limited to the context of distribution. Um, but there's another reason why this argument is a little bit of a poor fit against the server side public license being an open source license, and that's that. Um, historically, the open source initiative hasn't held the clearest line when it comes to applying Rule 9, at least in my opinion. So, for example, uh, GPL version 2 has long required licensees to provide not only the source code for the software itself that's licensed under the, under the license, but also the scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable. Now, as in the case of the laundry list of things that 
the SSPL requires you to provide. Um, scripts used to control compilation and installation of the executable are not actually the software itself. They're not a derivative work of the software. They are software that is uh, used to sort of um, deploy the software to, to sort of put it into practical effect um, in, in the specific context where you're using it. Um, so, you know, the OSI has in the past approved licenses that sort of reach beyond the software itself to, um, to other things that, that help you to deploy it in a particular instance. Um, and it's not really clear where the line is between what GPL v2 does, which is, you know, only reaching a little further to these scripts and maybe scripts are considered sort of less uh, substantial than, than the types of things that the SSPL was trying to require. But again, the line is just not that clear. And likewise, GPL v3 required that, you know, in addition to all of the things that GPL v2 required, um, the software that comes in embedded devices uh, or cons consumer electronics devices um, include any installation information required to install modified versions of the software back into the device. And so again, you could, you could read that as a restriction on a field of endeavor, um, as in the delivery of sort of locked down uh, consumer electronics devices. You could read it, read it as a restriction on the other software on the device, including the software that controls access to the device's internal software and memory. Um, but uh, both versions of the GPL have, of course, long been considered compliant with the open source definition, whereas the SSPL, which sort of like stretches these same types of requirements, was pretty roundly rejected. And all of this is just to say that, um, you know, which I think is the obvious, that the open source application, open source initiatives application of the open source definition is, uh, to particular licenses is necessarily political process. As in court where there's ambiguity in the constitution and the law, the political bias of the judges or just the people on the open source initiative mailing list can determine the outcome. And this isn't an inherently bad or wrong thing. It's a trade-off between certainty and adaptability in the open source definition. And our systems of law make the same trade-offs. Um, open source Initiatives License Review Committee is basically a conservative institution, applying established rules periodically to new cases and intentionally avoiding innovation. Uh, and as in a constitutional democracy, fundamental changes are supposed to be really difficult to make, and they happen slowly. Uh, and so when they do occur, it's typically the result of social change that sort of builds slowly or almost imperceptibly over time until suddenly the need for change is undeniable. And those changes can sneak up on you. And I, you know, again, I'm uh, I'm going to apologize for giving a, a very U.S.-centered um, metaphor here. But in the U.S., the first case, the first uh, court case challenging laws prohibiting gay marriage, uh, was brought in 1970. Um, as late as 1996, a Democratic U.S. president signed a federal law defending traditional marriage by defining it as between one man and one woman. In 1998, two states approved state constitutional amendments making gay marriage unconstitutional. So in the late 90s, there was like this sort of wall against this concept that, that gay marriage is something that, that, that the state should permit. And then in 2003, Massachusetts became the first state to explicitly permit gay marriage. And then nearly half of the states in the US followed over the course of just the next decade. So from you know, 1970 to 2003, no action. And then from 2004 to 2014, suddenly half the country is on board with this. Um, and in 2015, the US Supreme Court ruled gay marriage bans unconstitutional nationwide. And I don't mean to say that acceptance of ethical source licenses, much less business source licenses are as important as the legalization of gay marriage in the United States, um, or even that they're inevitable only that the recurrence of an idea over the course of time doesn't necessarily mean that it's tired or worn out or wrong. Um, sometimes it only means that it's building steam. And uh, while the triumph of gay marriage is perhaps a less compelling metaphor for the struggle of adoption of business-friendly licenses in particular, um, uh, the struggle of those licenses may be bound up inextricably with the evolution of copyleft licenses more generally. Um, it was the progressive wing of our movement, Richard Stallman's Free Software Foundation, that raised the alarm about the sort of 
application service provider loophole to begin with, that banner that's now being taken up by companies like MongoDB and Elastic from a very different perspective and set of incentives. Um, but the solution to that problem, the Afero GPL, never really had the impact on server-side software that the GPL did on the previous paradigm. And its model of software deployment maybe is outdated now as the GPL v2s was in 2007 when the Afero GPL was adopted, as the pace of technology technological development continues to increase. So while it's understandable that the OSI would see a license like the SSPL as a cynical attempt to co-opt open source for business advantage, it'll eventually have to reckon, I think, with a competent next generation copyleft license genuinely aimed at increasing software freedom or human freedom. And that license may look a lot more like the SSPL than it does like the AGPL. And if licenses are going to remain an effective tool for enforcing community values and bringing software freedom in this new age of distributed online network services, then something is going to have to give. Uh, thank you. That's my presentation. I understand that maybe I'll be thrown into a room for questions now. Hi, thank you so much, Aaron. Yes, uh, so many interesting topics. and. I have some questions myself, but I would like first to encourage you to post your questions in the chat in Prinzlauer Berg in uh, StreamYard, or sorry, in Venulus. Uh, any questions, you can either post them as a chat directly or in the questions tab, which is next to the, the chat top right. In the meantime, I will ask you a question, Aaron, because I don't see any questions sure. there just yet. Uh, so you said that the AGPL3 may be outdated for the needs of uh, recent companies and market activity. I think that's um, a fascinating concept. And so does that mean that you do see merit and justification in some of these additional restrictions on, on freedom that you described from MongoDB and Elastic? Do you, do you see that uh, they, I mean, do you fundamentally agree with those companies that restricting the freedoms that we're used to could be necessary to preserve freedom in the current commercial context? Well, um, I, I'm going to reserve judgment on that exact question. Um, but what what I, you know, there's there's always been this tension in in both free and open source li software licensing between, you know, restriction and and freedom, right, and different concepts of freedom. So, you know, if you are if you are sort of more uh, on the I, if you're if you're more concerned with the freedom of developers, then you might lean more toward uh, highly permissive open source licenses because in in one sense those grant more freedoms than a copyleft license. Whereas if you are concerned with ensuring your software is never used to restrict another person's freedom, then you may lean more toward a copyleft license. And so my point isn't that I agree with these companies uh, uh, and their particular restrictions it's more that if you if you believe that copyleft licensing has a place in the sort of new software paradigm then necessarily it's going to get more restrictive um, than existing copyleft licenses in the same way that uh, that the server-side public license got more restrictive and and you might be able to find a more clever way to do it and there are in fact several i think efforts to think about what the future of copyleft looks like in our community um copyleft conf um was started by the software freedom conservancy to consider sort of you know what the future of of copyleft ought to look like um i know a few people who have taken a stab uh at at drafting sort of model model copyleft licenses for for a new era including um richard fontana who who's at red hat and uh, a lawyer named kyle mitchell um and so these are these are all interesting efforts um but eventually you know we'll, <laughs> the i think the uncomfortable truth for the for copyleft proponents is that uh is that you know their their interests are bound up at, more with the interests of these companies who they tend to be highly suspicious of than than maybe they think. Hmm. Interesting. So you potentially see that freedoms will necessarily be more restricted in future. Then, um, I I, th I think it will be one strategy um, for for software freedom freedom proponents uh, for for attempting to sort of secure the freedoms of of. Uh, 
free and open source software licenses in, in the cloud environment. Thank you. And we, we have a question from uh, Jan Wildeboer, who some of us will be familiar with, about the interpretation of the SSPL by distributions. Uh, he says that Red Hat made the decision that it was not compatible for them to uh, distribute software under that license. And he asks about uh, whether other distributions necessarily need to take the same approach. D do you have an opinion on this, uh, about the compatibility of SSPL with distribution models uh, through software repositories and by existing open source Linux distributions? Uh, I mean, what I would say about that is, you know, it sort of goes back to the point I made at the beginning of this uh, of this talk, which is there are two ways to think about uh, what the open source, uh, what an open source license is. One is uh, that it is a license that conforms the open source definition, in which case you can make your own determination about whether uh, a particular license complies, regardless of whether the open source initiative is weighed in on it. And one is that it's an open source license that has been uh, approved by the OSI as conformant with the open source definition. Now, the open source initiative took the, uh, took the I think, unusual step um, in response to the server side public license of publishing a blog post signed by the open source initiatives board saying, um, even though it was withdrawn from the license review process, that the server side public license was not an open source license. Now, notably, I don't think they really gave much of a justification under the under the sort of specific terms of the open source definition for why that is. Um, certainly, the license stewards uh, MongoDB continued to you know assert that it was a, a valid open source license even after it was withdrawn. Um, just sort of saw the writing on the wall. Um, so I think certainly you know. Distributions can make their own decisions um, about this, but they 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 face their own uh, sort of internal processes, internal politics around around you know what ought to be considered an open source license, and so you know I think it, <laughs> um, it, it probably will be an uphill battle, um, but it, but of course you know anybody's allowed to interpret the open source definition as they please, and ultimately it's going to be the downstream users who have to decide whether. Um, whether it's an appropriate license for their use. Thank you very much.